Medellin is a city set in a valley in the Andes. The second largest city in terms of population, but the largest in terms of crime. As always, Medellin is still at the forefront of the evolution of Colombia's underworld. El cartel de Medellín nunca se acabó, se transformó y lo, los que le ganaron la guerra a Pablo Escobar se convirtieron en los jefes de, del cartel de Medellín, ¿cierto? From 2009 to July 2013, an estimated 7,000 people were killed in the Medellin Mafia Wars, as different challengers sought to claim Don Berna's criminal throne as head of the Oficina de Envigado, or the Envigado Office, and become the successor of the Medellin cartel. Those criminal organizations could be the Italian Mafia or the Lebanese Hezbollah. Hezbollah's primary uh, criminal enterprise today, not its only one, but certainly its most lucrative, is having individual operatives spaced and located within the Colombian narcotics world, not to produce uh, narcotics, but to be there as middlemen, as shippers, as transporters, and as money launderers. Um, as the state sponsorship, their state sponsorship, Iran, or their state sponsor, Iran, okay, as they began to slowly turn off the funding tap, if you will, or that funding stream, the Hezbollah naturally, to keep the movement alive, had to turn to other activities. And they pretty quickly moved from moving those very small amounts of cocaine out of the tri-border area of Colombia into moving multi-tons of cocaine across the Atlantic. It took them less than eight years to make that transition. Over half of the 51 designated terrorist organizations are involved in one or more aspects of the global drug trade now. Until his death in Medellin in 1993, Pablo Escobar was the unchallenged head of the Medellin cartel. Mire, el cartel de Medellín era demasiado fuerte. Tenía una flotilla de aviones más o menos de 140 sicarios. Tenía eh, una infraestructura de inteligencia brutal. Compraba agentes del Estado. Manejaba muchísima inteligencia, era una organización criminal totalmente, con muchísimo dinero, con muchísimas armas, con muchísimas armas y con muchísima infraestructura. For two years after Escobar's death, the Cali cartel was able to continue operating the same way, until the leaders, the Rodriguez Orguela brothers, were captured in 1995. Then the Colombian underworld became fragmented. Now, drug trafficking syndicates are eluding countering forces with new strategies. This meant working with the Italian Mafia in Europe and tapping into the huge Brazilian and Argentinian markets in South America. It also meant increased coordination between Colombian organized crime that had migrated to the Middle East and known Hezbollah associates that had been in Colombia for the past decade. We are aware of and concerned about allegations that some Latin American drug trafficking organizations are linked with Hezbollah and Iran. In October 2008, a joint endeavor by U.S. and Colombian investigators dismantled an international cocaine smuggling and money laundering ring that allegedly directed part of its profits to finance Hezbollah. Operation Titan was focused on Colombia and a guy named Chakri Harb. Uh, although there were others uh, that were involved. Uh, Chekri Harb uh, was tied uh, directly to this guy, Abdullah Safi al-Din, through the investigation, and to, uh, I believe, his son as well. And um, from there, we st the, 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 the Drug Enforcement Administration and the Department of Justice started to track uh, the sort of uh, fingerprints uh, of, the, of, of the accessories to this 
and indeed we found a wide network of super facilitators and uh, 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 financial facilitators uh, who were involved in partnership. Uh, and ultimately it, it was uh, uh, concluded uh, based on uh, evidence that was collected that indeed this was an organized conspiracy being carried out by the business affairs component of the Hezbollah's terrorist wing. The drugs were allegedly sent via Panama, Venezuela and Guatemala to the U.S., the Middle East and Europe. As they got deeper into that investigation, what they clearly realized that Hezbollah was at that time moving multi-tons of cocaine from the Andean region of, uh, of South America, meaning that, that region of Colombia, Peru and Bolivia where coca is, and co coca is converted ultimately to cocaine and, and produced. They're moving it from the Andean region into Venezuela where then it was, you know, myriad smuggling methods were used but they were moving uh, tons of cocaine into, uh, in, into principally into Europe. As the investigation progressed, the undercover agent got close enough to the cartel to serve as one of its money launderers. The agent laundered some $20 million, enabling the DEA to follow the money and map out much of the cartel's operations. But before Harb could identify his Hezbollah contacts to the DEA undercover agent, the operation broke down. Harb was charged with drug-related crimes in a sealed indictment filed in Miami in July 2008, but terrorism-related charges were not filed. Just now, I spoke on the phone with President Rouhani of the Islamic Republic of Iran. While some claim the operation ended due to interagency squabbling, many government officials believe that the Obama administration tamped down the investigation of Hezbollah for fear of jeopardizing the impending nuclear deal with Iran. There are historical ties between the Shia communities of Iran and Lebanon. But Hezbollah is the first uh, creation of the Islamic Republic of Iran's vision of exporting its revolution first to the other Shias, then to the Muslim world in general, and then far beyond. Lebanon was the Middle East's leading producer of illicit drugs in the 1970s and 1980s, with cultivation taking place mostly in the northern Bekaa Valley. That is according to the UNODC figures. Ultimately, Lebanon became a transit country for cocaine, with Lebanese nationals operating in concert with drug traffickers from Colombia and South America, according to the 2011 International Narcotics Control Strategy Report, released by the U.S. Department of State. <laughs> American intelligence analysts believe that for years Hezbollah received as much as 200 million annually from its primary patron, Iran, along with additional aid from Syria. But that support has diminished, the analysts say, as Iran's economy buckles under international sanctions over its nuclear program and Syria's government battles rising popular unrest. But they're, they're just their cocaine activity was generating as much as $200 million a month. It's important that you put that all into context and into perfect perspective. Cotonou, Benin. Night operation with the counter-terrorist unit. A brigade is patrolling along the coast, the new port of entry of the promised land. It seems that both the war on drugs and the war on terror are about to accelerate in West Africa. So Hezbollah helps move product from South America to Africa, that tenth parallel, they call it Highway 10, and then from there upwards into Europe, upwards into the Middle East, and laundering those funds. Groups such as Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghrib reportedly earn about half the profits generated from drug trafficking, and those can take the form of direct cash payments or weapons, ammunition, vehicles, or other equipment. started realizing the magnitude of this global uh, you know, network 
of just money launderers and drug traffickers, and we started looking even closer in Africa. So we eventually saw, working with counterparts on the ground in Africa, we started seeing uh, the collection of drug proceeds uh, and movement of millions and millions of dollars in cash on commercial flights from West African countries like Togo or Benin, right into Beirut, Lebanon. And that was pretty fascinating. As a DEA agent for 28 years, uh, I still look back and I just can't believe the magnitude of money that was being moved right into Beirut uh, in, and, and put into the money exchange houses uh, to be used for, for other business around the world. So we started tracking once the money was in these exchange houses. We followed the money into banks in Lebanon, specifically at that time, Lebanese Canadian Bank was one of the banks that surfaced in the investigation. Uh, and then monies were moving right back into the US. I mean, we put together a task force in the United States with some of the best in the business as far as global money movements and understanding global uh, international business. And we actually had a team with quite a few agencies and lots of expertise to watch the monies flowing around the world uh, from this organization. In February 2011, the Obama administration accused the Lebanese Canadian Bank, one of the rather secretive Lebanese banks, of money laundering for an international cocaine trafficking ring related to the Shia militias of Hezbollah. started seeing volumes and volumes of money in West Africa being collected by Lebanese couriers and then transported in suitcases on commercial flights right back to Lebanon, right into the exchange houses, and then from the exchange houses into uh, bank accounts all over Lebanon, but specifically Lebanese Canadian Bank was one of the most popular less used in this scheme. And then we started seeing like millions of dollars coming from Lebanon to corresponding accounts in the United States. And we couldn't figure out, at, at first, it was kind of like, what is all this money being used for in the US? Like, what are they doing? And started realizing that they were helping fund uh, these used car dealerships all over the United States to buy cars, whether at auto auctions, at some local car dealerships, and then send the cars back to West Africa to resell, to make more money. So, you know, we were always told that maybe they made 20, 25 percent on every car that they sold down in West Africa. So all that money was like commingled and then sent back through the cycle into Lebanon, right through the exchange houses, to the banks, to the correspondent accounts, and the whole scheme just kind of grew. The cars imported from the U.S. were sent to one of the biggest car lots in town. The car dealer, Ali Karoubi, was a prominent Lebanese businessman. So Hezbollah was involved all along the way. Hezbollah was involved in Hezbollah supporters, Hezbollah sympathizers, um, Hezbollah operatives. They would be involved in either currying the money across the border, the money would go down the, the coast of West Africa, cross the Toga-Ghana border, end up at the airport in Ghana, at the Accra airport, and then it would be flown to Lebanon. And typically those couldn't be direct flights because they don't have that many direct flights, Beirut to Accra. So they would typically fly through um, Europe, Paris, um, Frankfurt, and they would have couriers, oftentimes Hezbollah-related Hezbollah couriers, who would body carry cash, have carry in their, the cash in their luggage, and transport it into um, Beirut. And there, Hezbollah would, the couriers would literally get to go off the plane first. The car lots in the United States, one linked to a separate Hezbollah weapon smuggling scheme, were not moving nearly enough merchandise to account for all that cash. What was really going on was that European drug proceeds were being intermingled with the car sale cash to make it appear legitimate. 
There were two exchange houses, Alyssa and Ayash, that were also designated as part of this process, and they absolutely had a very, very close relationship and worked together with the Lebanese Canadian Bank. In countries like Lebanon, oftentimes a huge source of um, the cu currency transactions occur through exchange houses that need to, they can exchange the, the funds for individuals, but in order to, to move the money across the world, those exchange houses need to rely upon finance banks to be able to, to put that money into the international stream of commerce. Exchangers can exchange sort of within the country, within people, you know, between people, between companies, but they need a connection to a global financial institution, and Lebanese Canadian Bank provided that connection. Auditors brought in to scrub the books, discovered nearly 200 accounts that were suspicious for their links to Hezbollah and their classic signs of money laundering. The two exchange houses belong to Ayman Jama, a Colombian Lebanese national formerly of Medellin. Ayman Juma is a professional money launderer. He's a large-scale, major, you know, launderer of primarily narcotics proceeds. I say primarily because money launderers tend to not necessarily be discriminating. They'll launder money for whatever purpose, but I believe that the bulk of what he was doing was laundering money for major narcotics trafficking organizations. Jamal was part of a very large money laundering and narcotics trafficking ring that supplied cocaine to, among other people, the Los Zetas Mexican drug cartels. And he also laundered money from the drug proceeds back to the Colombian suppliers of cocaine. Hezbollah received its cut either from the exchange houses or via the bank itself. Today, the same networks are still active, and it is most likely that Karubi is still involved. March 2016, the Arab League blacklists Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. They decide to sanction all of Hezbollah, without distinction between the group's military and political wings. A week earlier, the European Union voted to label the military wing of Hezbollah a terrorist organization. By its own terms, the Iran deal was supposed to contribute to regional and international peace and security. And yet, while the United States adheres to our commitment under the deal, the Iranian regime continues to fuel conflict, terror, and turmoil throughout the Middle East and beyond. We'll see in the future how the Trump administration will track the drug terrorism that Hezbollah practices. But meanwhile, Hezbollah continues to adapt to the changing international drug market. The Hezbollah International Financing Prevention Act was a very important step that was taken by the United States to undermine Hezbollah financial activities around the world. I think it's important at the outset to note that the act is not targeted at Lebanon. The act doesn't use the word Lebanon anywhere in it. The act targets Hezbollah financial activity anywhere that it occurs in the world. Um, and if there is a financial institution that is knowingly doing significant financial activity with Hezbollah, that financial institution runs the risk of being cut off from the U.S. financial system. Wherever that uh, financial institution is in the world, regardless of whether their conduct is legal in the country in which that financial institution is located. Now, of course, given Hezbollah's presence in Lebanon, this act has particular importance within Lebanon. And that is why when I was uh, in the U.S. Treasury, and I'm assuming the U.S. Treasury is continuing to work very closely with the Lebanese Central Bank, uh, the Lebanese Central Bank Governor, and the Lebanese banking system to ensure that they are doing everything that they can to make sure that they are not conducting significant transactions with Hezbollah. They're relying very, very heavily on uh, the Hawala network right now to move money around the world. Um, you know, the black market peso exchange. I, and that's, to me, that's what is most threatening about, about Hezbollah. Mm -hmm.